Join us and help us continue to support the many talented people of our community. Learn how to get your business highlighted on Lacrosse Local. Go to lacrosselocal.com and click on advertise. The Frozen River Film Festival is taking place February 5th through 12th in Winona, Minnesota. Nearly 50 feature and short form documentary films that will take you to the heart of current events, the forefront of social change, and distinct cultures in an increasingly global community. For tickets and more information, visit frff.org. Join us at the Lacrosse Winter Roots Festival Saturday, February 11th at the Lacrosse Center. We'll celebrate Wisconsin favorites in music, cuisine, local beer, and spirits. Grab tickets at lacrosselocal.com. We talk with Mitchell Weber, a self proclaimed butcher, baker, mover, and shaker. Mitchell has opened Sagra Food and Wine, featuring a variety of changing dishes. We talk about this Italian-inspired, locally-sourced pop-up, from its origins to the seasonal menu to getting reservations. You can find more conversations, food reviews, live music, and events on our website, lacrosselocal.com. I'm Amy. And I'm Brent. And this is Lacrosse Local. Mitchell Weber. Uh, I was born here in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, I guess you could say I'm a townie of sorts. I did move away for quite some time here and there, but... Uh, Grew up in La Crosse and now reside in La Crosse. First got into cooking. Geez, a couple a couple things really stick out. Um, I guess the big one would be a childhood friend of mine. His father had just purchased a KitchenAid stand mixer. Hmm. At the time, KitchenAid was kind of going through this like rebranding, like resurgence. You know, they were big in like the... 50s and 60s, everyone had one on the counter, some sort of planetary mixer. But in the 90s, they kind of had a resurgence. And uh, I won't forget the day that his father brought one home. And we were just all eyes. It was like bright red and looked so good up on the countertop. And uh, we were very ambitious. What did we make? I think we tried to make pretzels. And they were absolutely terrible. (laughs) Worst pretzels I've ever had. Knowing the things I know now about how to make a pretzel, we def- definitely skipped a few steps. But yeah, that's that's definitely one thing that I remember um, as a kid. And I think it was just the idea of not knowing and just finding that reaction, kind of playing with the dough, not really knowing where it's going to go, and um, just hoping for the best result. And I think that's what interested me so much is like this unknown of... Um, of cooking in general. I think that's really how I got into it, to be honest. And it, it still surprises me today. I mean, cooking and I guess being a chef, you could say, is just this constant, constant education. And I think that that is what keeps me going with it. Checking out your website, and your social presence, you know, it seemed to just pop out of nowhere for me when I saw this, you know, I think it was on Instagram, trying to figure out where you're located, who you are. And also just this interest from, you know, Roman and Italian fair. Like, how do you go from that early experience to where this business is now? I mean, it's relatively new, right? Yeah, it's fairly new. I mean, we've we've definitely done a lot to keep it under cover, which sounds silly. Like, you wouldn't think that you'd want to keep a new business under cover. You want, you want it to be packed all the time. But we really didn't do a big marketing push. And we tried to keep it a secret for a long time. And the word's finally kind of starting to get out. But it's had that exclusivity thing going on where, like you said, nobody knows we're there. And um, you walk into the space that you may have been in in the past. And you're surprised at the transformation that it's kind of undergone. Yeah, as far as the Roman and Italian kick there, one of my first jobs here in La Crosse was at a place called Eduardo's. I don't oh, know yeah. if you're from us or if you're familiar. Oh, yeah. They had, they had these cheese curds. You remember those things? Yeah, I do, actually. I a golf ball. <laughs> but yeah, I, I worked there and I just, it's kind of like this romantic thing where when I think back about it, yeah, you miss some of the people and you miss the food, but it's really like when you'd walk in the back door five minutes before your shift and all you could smell was like the yeast from the dough proofing. And you could smell the wood fired oven burning and the red sauce simmering. Like it was just this whole thing. 
And when I look back, it's like that is kind of what grabbed a hold of me, I think. There's a special place in my heart, not only for that restaurant, because we would go there as a kid, like when I was growing up, we would go there for special special occasions. And, um, you know, then I ended up working there for a little while. And I think there's just something about that spaghetti meatball kind of setting that I really love and miss. And we don't really have it in the cross right now. Not that we're really doing like spaghetti and meatballs and the five cheese baked ziti and, uh, you know, <laughs> you can eat soup salad and breadsticks. <laughs> we definitely try to incorporate some, some things on the menu that kind of bring back those memories of restaurants like that. Man, Eduardo's, you know, that's just like a blast from the past in terms of like, that's where I went to, we'd go eat there for dances in high school. Yeah. Um, but remember all those, you know, different elements that you shared there. So what was the initial kind of start for this business? Like, I mean, you kind of talked about your pathway there, but how do you pronounce the name? How is that said? It's pronounced Sagra. Okay. Like what was the day or the moment that just kind of said, we're going to do this? Well, it was a lot of things kind of all coming together. A big part of that was I had moved back to lacrosse during the pandemic. Like many people didn't didn't have work and kind of had to decide like what direction I was going to start going because it seemed like the food and beverage and hospitality industry was going to be shut down for quite some time and nobody really knew what the outcome was going to be. So it was a very sad time in my life. I mean, you take something that you love so much like that and it's gone. And then you have to try to figure out <laughs> your pivot in which direction you're going to go. Part of it was just realizing, like, if I'm going to be back and living in lacrosse, I'm going to make damn sure that we make the most of it. And otherwise, you know, I've got to try to find find the next thing. That's all part of it. You know, some self-fulfillment there. Like I just, I was working jobs that I didn't really care for making decent money and working with good people. But, you know, you go into work every day and it's just like the same grind, not what you're used to. It's hard going from like one of your best jobs you've ever had to the very bottom, you know, feeling like every day is a drag. And uh, so I just needed a big change. And we were looking at a standalone building to put a restaurant in. We were vetting this space for a long time and it it didn't really work out. And a friend of mine, uh, Chris Roderick, who owns Piggies, he kind of approached me and said, you know, we did this remodel upstairs and we're not doing a ton of events right now. And there's a full kitchen up here, bathrooms, you name it. Like it's set up to go. It's really just like, you know, superficial things that we need up here, artwork, yada, yada, yada. So we took the opportunity to rent at Piggies and that's mm -hmm. kind of how it came about. It's definitely something that we were, we were seeking out. Like I said, we wanted our own brick and mortar, but this is the best that we could do at the time. I just find it interesting, you know, these past, like whatever it's been, COVID confuses me on time, but three years where, you know, I think people have these thoughts in the back of their mind to start these businesses. It seems like it's it's a moment right now for all these different, you know, cooks at home or, you know, whatever art business to actually just start those through that process. It's, it's quite interesting to talk to these different people that just started businesses during probably the most difficult time in their life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's funny too, uh, you know, one of my best friends is a uh, sourdough baker by trade. He's a damn good one. But it seemed like during the pandemic, everybody and their brother was making sourdough bread. <laughs> you know, they were trying to uh, sell it out of their trunk or on Marketplace or whatever it was. It was definitely a strange time. Checking out your website, just seeing you kind of pop up. How does it all work? Like, how does it work in terms of reservations? I actually, I got on your email list, it looks like. So I got your actually list for this weekend. But how do people go about it? What's the deal? It's a little different. I mean, we don't really have like, we do a lot online. Um, I field most 99% of the reservations through email. It's kind of this uh, 
this whole process where I don't really get our availability from our farmers till Sunday nights or Monday mornings. So what happens there is I get this availability. I get an idea of what they have, what I'm going to buy. I make the order. I write the menu based off of what we can get in. And then I post that menu to the website. I also send out a flyer to, as you said, uh, the email subscribers. I'm sure you got one this morning. And then people can either visit the website to make a reservation. I do have a phone number listed. But yeah, we just we put the menu out about a week ahead of time. We open the reservations for Saturday and Sunday evenings. We tend to fill up pretty quickly. I mean, we've had a couple a couple slumps, but for the most part, we're we're pretty well booked by Thursday night or Friday night for the weekend. The second part of that is it's not super traditional in terms of oh, we're going to go in at 7.15 and we're going to order like some appetizers and uh, a couple salads and then we might have some cocktails and then share some dessert. It's prefix menu. So when you make that reservation with us, you come in and you eat what we what we make for you that week. So it tends to be like five to six courses. Start Usually starts with charcuterie and then heads into like something highlighting vegetables, which is our giardini section on the menu. And it, then we get into pasta or some kind of dumpling. Typically, uh, we do make all of our pasta in house, egg noodles and extruded pasta, which is which is a pretty fun, pretty fun thing. And then there's usually a small entree that that's shared and that's all followed by dessert. So it tends to be quite a bit of food, but it is served family style. So it has that kind of like shareable aspect to it but yeah people seem to dig it something that's that's quite a bit different than the standard here in the cross and i think that's a big selling point for us just checking out again your website and you kind of touched on it locally sourced informs your menu i'm sure the seasons you know you even have seasonally obsessed so you know <laughs> yeah. why is that important to you i mean it's that's so deep it's uh <laughs> It's just, I, I feel, to put it in the simplest terms, I just feel like that's the way it should be. I don't think that, and you, you can argue this from either side, I suppose, but if you're serving asparagus in January, that's not really a great thing. And um, you see it all the time. You see to, you see side salads with cherry tomatoes. And it's, it's February. You know, <laughs> where are you getting that stuff? Is it coming from Peru? You know, so it is in season somewhere, but it had to travel 3,000 miles to get here and it had to cross hands and cross docks and pallets. And uh, it's just not something that we advocate for. Now, don't get me wrong, like we do a lot of seasonal food. Actually, everything is seasonal, but we try to source as local as possible. And those two things are can be worlds apart. For instance, we had persimmons on our menu i've got a persimmon plug up on the west coast and we've had artichokes in and those are not necessarily things that grow around here however when they are in the height of season in other places i don't mind buying them as long as they're from a good source but definitely not a big like commodity produce buyer by any means um we really like to know where these things come from we like to know who's producing them, planting them, pulling them out of, out of the ground. I think we've done a really good job with our relationship with Owl Bluff Farms in particular, mm -hmm. who we buy most of our produce from. You hear it a lot. You hear farm to table. You hear the buzzwords, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, it's just the way it should be. It's, you should be able to get anything you need within a couple hundred miles and if you can't, you probably don't really need it that bad. <laughs> you know, seeing a lot of different restaurants pop in the lacrosse area, it's so refreshing to have these things come back to lacrosse or at least just kind of happen in lacrosse with all the organic farmers and the, the local producers in the area. So if people want to follow along or, you know, sign up for the upcoming uh, dinners, what's the best avenue for them to go to? I would say the website's number one. It's just a good resource for what we're doing um at the moment instagram is also good 
we do field things like reservations through direct messages. Like I said, I, I try to get a flyer out. I create this flyer every week and it just has some basic info on it. It's like semi appealing to the eye. I'm, I'm no designer or marketing uh, guru, but I did my best with it. So uh, I'm sure you've seen those in the past. They kind of just have a few pictures um, of some of the food and the atmosphere. We always put the menu out there on the flyer and uh, contact information as well. So the best bet is to, if you really want to stay up to date with us, one, head to the website and put in your info for the newsletter subscription. I try to send one thing out a week. So it's not like, you know, it's not super annoying. It might get <laughs> annoying at some point, but but it's it's usually like Monday evening, Tuesday morning, I'll send out the newsletter on a weekly basis. But people can also keep up with us on Instagram. I'm not very good with Facebook. So like anything we can send from Instagram to Facebook, uh, we will. But I'm more of an Instagram person, so I, that's where I spend like most of my time. Well, yeah, man, your website has has some damn pretty good pictures, you know. Thanks. It's tough. You may go on the website and see some things, but uh, because we are seasonal and because we do change the menu as often as every week, there are going to be some things on there that you might not see again until July or August. Lacrosse Local Podcast is a production of River Travel Media. Do you have an interview idea you'd like to share with us? Message us on Facebook at Lacrosse Local. Find out more about us at lacrosselocal.com. And you can subscribe to the Lacrosse Local Podcast on your favorite podcast app. If you like us, rate us five stars. We appreciate it.